Welcome to the Nobel Peace Center. I am Kjersti Flökstad and I'm very happy to guide you through this uh, seminar today. We are continuing to explore the Nobel Peace Prize of 2020 awarded to World Food Program. And today we are going to look into how breaking down the silos can help with a cooperative approach to humanitarian development and peace actions. Uh, this series is a co-production between us here at the Nobel Peace Center and the United Nations World Food Program. Following the UN Secretary General's call to break down the silos and adapt a whole of society approach to respond to various crises, this panel today will discuss ways to translate this ambition into concrete actions and corporations on the ground. We will discuss the role and responsibilities of different stakeholders and explore a more cohesive and complementary approach to humanitarian development and peace initiatives. I'm very honored and proud to introduce our very prominent and highly experienced panel with different perspectives on these particular issues. We have Ellen Johnson Sirleaf, Nobel Peace Laureate of 2011 and the first female president of Liberia. We also have with us Per Olsen Fritt, Sweden's Minister of International Development Cooperation, Fernanda Lopez Larsen, Executive Vice President of Africa and Asia in Yara Company, Stanleik uh, Stan Samkange, Senior Director, Strategic Partnerships Division, World Food Program. Mary Ellen Magrogi, representative and country director of UN World Food Program in Afghanistan, and Mustafa Umar, chief executive officer of Shelter for Life International. I will give a more present, uh, deep presentation of them as we go through the program. Our first speaker and keynote speaker is Her Excellency Ellen Johnson Sirleaf. She was the first democratically elected female president in Africa. She oversaw a reign of uninterrupted peace for Liberia f in, for 12 years. An endeavor she has been awarded and acclaimed many times, not at least with the Nobel Peace Prize Laureate uh, 2011. Madam President, Warmly welcome to us today. We so much look forward to hearing from you. I'm honored to participate in this discussion on an issue which has claimed much thought and effort for many years. My congratulations to the World Food Program recipient of the Nobel Peace Prize 2020. I must first place our conversation in the context of the COVID pandemic for several reasons. The first is that it is the overwhelming force in the world today, calling the very same way of working as the humanitarian development and Nexus. As the pandemic hit, we saw efforts by countries to remain in silence, believing that they could isolate themselves from the pandemic if they only address their particular situation. We saw lock ins school closed, hospital closed, 
we saw most people retreating into their own situation. Today we can say most have long abandoned that, recognizing that solidarity, collaboration, trying to multilateralism are the critical causes for crushing the pandemic. The disasters are very profound and coming together is still slow as evidenced by the previous unwillingness to share vaccine with poor countries who don't have the capacity to fund research and production. We have all paid much attention with a lot of favorable comments to the recent decision by the leaders of seven countries who really have raised the bar with a commitment to end COVID-19 through global cooperation. This would mean the of equitable and affordable access and delivery of safe and effective COVID-19 vaccines, diagnostics, and therapeutics through the tools accelerator and the COVAX facility. We all recall that the goal is to give 1 billion doses by late 2021, 2 billion doses by 2022, and to vaccinate at least two thirds of the population by the end of the year 2022. There also appears to be growing support to work with the WTO leadership in a call for a temporary waiver on vaccine patient patents, allowing expansion of production and equitable access to vaccines. All of these will enable many countries, particularly poor countries in Africa, to be able to produce vaccines at the local level, making it quite more effective in delivery to the population. In all of these efforts, we see some of the key factors required for the humanitarian development and peace nexus. Collaboration and coordination of a multitude of actors Empowerment of local capacity, a strong governance framework, and the presence of the state providing the leadership to provide the necessities as a public good. I remember one of my former staff telling me some years ago that she participated in a year-long meeting in what was called then the Relief to Development Continuum. The end, the end result was that it was decided that there was no such thing as it could not be a linear process. We all know today we have moved far away from that. And the UN reforms reflect this. I want to offer a small illustration based on a recent exchange I have uh, with, with a UNDP uh, country officer, one whom I knew very well. In the province Kasai Central, the government of the Republic, Democratic Republic of Congo is partnering with the UN, development partners, local civil society, and international NGOs to address issues of conflict, poverty, and displacements. In this collaboration, there are several core areas, food, nutrition, and resilience. 
to ensure that people in that area are able to grow sufficient and diverse food to feed their families and to suffer income, as well as to increase their coping mechanisms, ending impunity for the high incidence and normalized culture of normal activities, support of youth aspirations for education and employment, a restoration of state institutions we can ensure access to social services, restoring citizens' trust in their local and central government officials. This process may offer some valuable lessons if it's successful. In my time as an Assistant Secretary General at UNDP, I had my own frustrations with the slow pace of development, recognizing underdevelopment or stall development as a threat to peace. I believed and still believe that equitable and sustainable development prevents conflicts and is the foundation of peace. The Sustainable Development Goals, which are interlinked and integrated, are the path to peace, justice, and prosperity. We must move away from a constant cycle of peace building and humanitarian assistance, each in its own silo often repeated some years down the line. Here I must also say that I believe that a fundamental reason for the absence of peace sticking, the absence of ensuring that peace continues is the absence of women at the peace table there can be no lasting peace without women's voice and agency. The record on that is clear. Women suffer most from conflicts. Women carry the burdens of trying to negotiate the end to conflict but women lose their voice, the authority and the power when we return to normalcy. This is something that we must all work in these changing times right now as we seek to come back to the methods of collaboration and coordination. As we bring back multilateralism which seem, to, which seem to have been affected in the past decade or so. Distinguished participants and convener, thank you again for inviting me. I look forward to listening and learning from all of you. Thank you so much for uh Oh, sorry. Thank you so much for your cohesive and very insightful uh, overview of the connection between all of these issues we are talking about today. And also thank you for reminding us of the pandemic and the, how important that issue is to solve, to solve all other problems and be a global community. I had a feeling that we could have continued this conversation with uh, Madam President Ellen Sherliff John uh, Johnson Sherliff uh, for a long time because there was a lot of issues that she uh, she was uh, highlighting. But we need to move on. Our next speaker is uh, Per Olsen Frit. He is the Minister of International Development Cooperation in of Sweden, and Sweden was one of four countries in the Security Council behind Resolution 2417 condemning starvation of civilians as a method of warfare. Minister, the floor is yours. He's not, okay? N next speaker, okay. <laughs>
Okay, then we did uh, as, as, uh, a small um, change of, uh, of, pl of plans here. We will then move over to Fernanda Lopez Larsen. Uh, she is the Executive Vice President for Africa and Asia for Diara. Private sector's role has been increasingly recognized as an important partner in development. And Fernanda will offer us a private sector lens on today's uh, discussion. Uh, and we will hear how Yara works and see their role to support food systems through alliances such as Farm to Market and the Action Africa initiative. But before Fernanda Larsen uh, um, take the floor, we will watch a small video. The fact that Africa still needs to import food is a missed opportunity. Farm to Market Alliance is a partnership program between public and private sector, improving the lives of smallholder farmers by moving them from subsistence agriculture to commercial agriculture. Under the FTMA Alliance, we come in with knowledge and we train all the farmers that are in the Alliance. Most of the farmers don't use fertilizer because they don't have the knowledge. Through our various interventions on training, farmers know what type of fertilizer to use. They know the rate and when to apply. Kwa kweli mradi umenisaidia sana. Awamu ya kwanza nilikuwa nikilima ekali mbili, ekali moja, napata pengine gunia 10, 8. Kwa kwa sasa nategemea kuwa na gunia zaidi ya 300 na kidogo kwa sababu we've grown over the last three years from 5000 to 50000 farmers and we'll be growing to 250,000 farmers in the next two to three years. The idea is over a period of 10 years, we reach out to a million plus farmers. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, first of all, for the invitation um, to be here today uh, with such a distinguished panel um, taking part in, in, in such an important discussion. Um, as you mentioned, I work for Yara International, uh, and in Yara, our mission is uh, to responsibly feed the world and protect the planet. Uh, we are a manufacturer of fertilizers, so uh, therefore helping feeding people is, is part of our business, is, is, is what we do. Um, but we believe that we need to do that uh, in a way that the planet, the planet also is respected and in collaboration with other stakeholders. Like most companies um, that operate globally, we face challenges, be them logistical challenges, political challenges, financial challenges. And sometimes those challenges are too big for us to resolve them um, alone. So we must resort to collaboration, working together with others to find solutions. The region that I'm responsible for uh, in Yara, which is uh, Africa and Asia, is, I believe, a prime example of where collaboration and bringing down silos can actually generate concrete and fruitful results. And I'd like um, to give those two concrete examples here, as you mentioned in your introduction. Uh, so as you saw in the video, Yara participates in the Farm to Market Alliance. Um, the Farm to Market Alliance is a unique uh, group of six agri-focused organizations uh, that are collaborating on the ground to develop a sustainable and profitable agricultural sector in Africa. Uh, the World Food Program is actually the leading partner in this. This is a, a public and private consortium, uh, and we're seeking to transform the food value chain in emerging markets. Um, FTMA, as we, we say in, a, in an abbreviated form, um, is helping farmers by providing training, access to finance, um, quality inputs, um, technology and access to markets so that the smallholder farmers can actually sell their produce. So in a nutshell, we are supporting um, that transition from smallholder far, for smallholder farmers from subsistence to commercial agriculture, and that's very important. Um, we work closely within the region government as well. We are a Norwegian company, 
uh, and we work closely with our government to secure funding. Actually, in, in 2020, uh, the Norwegian government announced that you will support uh, FTMA with $17 million over the next three years uh, to support operations in Tanzania, Kenya, Rwanda, and Zambia, reaching more than 600,000 farmers. Uh, in fact, Mar Farm to Market Alliance won the WFP Innovation Prize in 2017, which I believe is a testimony um, of the success of uh, such a collaborative approach. Uh, the other example that was mentioned uh, was Action Africa. So this is an initiative where IARA uh, committed 40,000 tons of premium fertilizers plus agronomic expertise and digital enablement to smallholder farmers in Africa. Um, as Madam President uh, mentioned before, um, with the COVID-19 pandemic, so food insecurity, um, it was bound to increase. Uh, and we identified the need to act immediately, really quickly. Um, so Action Africa is also a public-private partnership supported by uh, the UN World Food Programme, the Norwegian government as well, and some African institutions. Um, so through Action Africa, smallholder farmers in Kenya, Uganda, Rwanda, Tanzania, Zambia, Malawi, and Mozambique, uh, they receive the fertilizer, agronomic support, which in turn helps them produce more food um, for a million people over one year. This corresponds to approximately 250,000 farmers. So it is through collaborations like that um, that I believe we can create a real difference uh, through the private sector for smallholder farmers across the globe. So much, uh, Fernanda Lopez Larsen. Uh, we will come back to you in the panel afterwards. So thank you so much for that very interesting uh, intervention. Now we have connection again to Stockholm. So uh, uh, the minister, Per Ulsson Fritt, we would like to uh, hear from you your perspective on, um, on the connection between uh, starvation and uh, peace and uh, conflict. Floor is yours. Well, thank you very much, uh, and thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to, to address you uh, here today. Uh, a special thanks, of course, to the Nobel Peace Center in Oslo and to the World Food Program for organizing this distinguished panel and this important conversation. I think the topic of today's conversation is very timely. Uh, we're now uh, more than one year into the decade of action on the SDGs, but instead of closing in on our goals, we are witnessing the reversal of years of one development gains. Conflicts have increased in scope, in complexity, often becoming protracted crises. And conflicts, COVID-19, climate change, loss of biodiversity, have together pushed some 174 million people into acute hunger and 34 million people just one step away from starvation. Close to half a million are already in famine, of which many are in Tigray in Ethiopia. In a time when we produce more food than ever before, more than we can consume actually, the list of countries on the brink of famine is steadily and rapidly increasing. So food insecurity in turn can create grievance and spur violence, fueling a vicious cycle of conflict and hunger. And Sweden brought uh, this link to the attention of the UN Security Council, uh, as we've heard, during our membership in, the, in 2017 to 2018. This led to the adoption of, of the Security Resolution 2417, which for the first time recognized the need to prevent and end conflict-induced hunger. And this was really affirmed last year, when the Nobel Peace Prize was awarded to the World Food Programme. More than a well-deserved recognition, this price was also important as a reminder that we now, more than ever, must transform those commitments into actions. To turn the tide of hunger, avert famine, and achieve zero hunger by 2030, we must sim simultaneously address the needs, the triggers, and the root causes. In other words, we must move from words to deeds and put the humanitarian development peace nexus approach into action. 
So what do we actually mean when we talk about breaking down the silos? It's not about diffusing roles or uh, overstretching responsibilities. What we need to do is strengthening coordination and improving conditions for the stakeholders to work co cohesively together, capitalizing on their respective and complementary comparative advantages. This starts with a common understanding, of course, of needs, of risks, vulnerabilities, resilience, and underlying causes of crisis and of conflict. This is crucial to be able to tackle challenges such as climate security, socioeconomic risks, ensuring women's participation, and to select among our tools for prevention, humanitarian, development, and peace-building efforts, those that are most adopted or adapted to the context. Local actors must be involved early, in early warning, to identify tensions, threats, and societal mobilization. Second, we are learning that the way in which we provide food aid matters. In fragile contexts, conflict-sensitive programming that incorporates conflict analysis throughout planning and implementation is crucial, both within immediate humanitarian response and long-term development. So in here I really want to welcome the World Food Programme's efforts to strengthen conflict analysis and conflict sensitivity in your work, including through your partnership with CIPRI and the International Crisis Group. Third, we need to increase coordination between, cap between key actors in the field in full respect of their specific mandates and principles. I think humanitarian actors need to better prepare the ground for development actors through catalytic and time-limited interventions that help reducing dependency on humanitarian aid and enable a transition to development actors. And development actors need to start accepting the complexity of crisis and step in at an earlier stage to seek synergies and complementaries with humanitarian assistance. This is critically, particularly in protracted humanitarian crises, such as Yemen, as an example, where years of conflict have set back human development by two decades and caused a looming risk of large-scale famine. Development actors cannot wait until there is peace in Yemen, which is much needed, until they start programming. So with these words, I thank you, and I look forward to a productive exchange. Back to uh, thank you so much uh, for that. Um, as you mentioned, the UN Security uh, Council Resolution 2417 acknowledged the uh, link between hunger and conflict. How do you in Sweden translate this uh, growing evidence of food security contributing to the prospect of peace into your uh, humanitarian and development priorities? Well, thank you. I think that is an, a very important question. Fighting food insecurity is a huge priority, not only to save lives and, and reach SDG 2 on zero hunger, but also to help create the conditions for peace. Right now, however, we have several looming famines and a widening gap between humanitarian needs and available financing. And therefore, we must all do more to ensure that the very urgent and acute humanitarian uh, food needs can be met already now during 2021. So in addition to volume and flexible, unearmarked, multi-year and front-loaded funding, this, this is the most efficient way to respond to humanitarian needs and to avert famine. And Sweden is proud, of course, to be a top donor of flexible, multi-year funding to the World Food Programme. But it's equally important that we build and invest in resilience to help communities withstand climate shocks and the reduced biodiversity. And this includes taking action on, on climate-related security risks affecting food security and food systems. And this will inevitably help reduce risks uh, of conflict over scarce resources. So initiatives under Action Track 5, as an example, under the Food Systems Summit, to ensure continued functionality of sustainable food systems in areas prone to conflict or natural disasters for that sake, that will be imperative. But finally, as an answer, governments and donors to both humanitarian response and to long-term development 
must become better at anticipating risks and act upon them before it's too late and the cost is too high. More and larger prevention measures that strengthen millions of vulnerable people will be needed. So these measures should be financed mainly, of course, through long-term development cooperation. Um, and that said, there is a scope for UN actors to increase, uh, again, to increase their collaboration with development actors cre to create these conditions where long-term action and measures to anticipate the humanitarian crisis, uh, to create that space where that, where that could happen. Thank you. Thank you. And we will uh, hear more from you in the panel afterwards. So thank you for now. Okay, our next speaker, Stan Lake Samkange, is Senior Director of Strategic Partnerships a Division of the United uh, Nations World Food Programme. You also have a global perspective on the issues at hand. Um, and most of your work has centered around people living in areas where hunger and political conflict run high. So I'm very, we very much look forward to hearing from your perspective on cooperation from World Food Programme's headquarter in Rome. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, moderator. I'm very pleased to be here uh, today with this distinguished panel that also reflects the subject of today's discussion, breaking through the silos. Uh, starting with uh, President uh, Johnson Sirleaf, who did so much to address these issues, not just as president of Liberia, but in her time before, uh, working on behalf of development across Africa. Uh, and uh, as she mentioned, looking at these, this, the humanitarian development peace nexus. Uh, also, I uh, would like to say that uh, Sweden has been a very strong supporter of WFP, but also a very flexible one, a very flexible donor and a very good partner for us. I'm very pleased to uh, have Minister Fried here. Yara, you've seen from the video, a close partner with WFP, but there are many other things that we've also been working with Yara on, and we very much value the private sector engagement. Uh, and Shelter for Life is working, doing very good work in many of the areas that are of most concern to, to us. So I'm very pleased to be in, in this panel to, today. Uh, ending hunger and achieving food security and improved nutrition, that's the focus of WFP. Uh, so how did we end up with a Nobel Peace Prize? Uh, well, two facts about SDG2 and about ending global hunger. Uh, one, you can't achieve SDG2 on its own. Uh, the SDGs uh, have to be taken together, and unless you're also focused on contributing to SDG 1, eliminating poverty, contribute, contributing to gender equality, for example, SDG 5, or economic growth, SDG 8, or SDG 16, and strong institutions, unless you're also making progress against those uh, uh, SDGs, you're not going to achieve SDG 2. So we have an obligation in our focus on eliminating hunger and supporting countries to address food security, to look at how we can also engage uh, and contribute to achieving these other SDGs. But the second fact about achieving SDG 2 is you can't achieve it without peace. Uh, if there's no peace, there's no food security. Uh, and that's a basic uh, fact. So that's why we are very much involved also as an actor, as a contributor to peace. Uh, in 2016, the UN Security Council and the UN General Assembly passed uh, twin resolutions uh, on the term they call sustaining peace. Uh, they define that as a goal and a process to build a common vision of a society ensuring that the needs of all segments of the population are taken into account, which encompasses activities aimed at preventing the outbreak, escalation, continuation, and recurrence of conflict, addressing root causes, assisting parties to end, uh, to conflict to end hostilities, ensuring national reconciliation, and moving towards recovery, reconstruction, and development. That's how the Security Council and the General Assembly both define sustaining peace. 
And we certainly see ourselves within that description. And I hope everybody sees themselves in that description because one of the facts about uh, achieving peace is, is uh, President Johnson Sirleaf said, you don't achieve it in a vacuum. And everybody needs to be a peace actor. Everybody needs to contribute in their own way. We contribute uh, in three basic ways. We, we focus uh, and we, we work in, the, in areas related to prevention. So before you even get to a hot conflict, you need to do everything you can uh, in the space of prevention. And that's where we're trying to work now increasingly with international financial institutions, development partners, earlier on in the phase before you get to conflict. Second, uh, in the context of mitigating conflict, especially in the context, uh, as Mr. Fried just talked about, Resolution 2417, preventing hunger from being used as a weapon of war. Uh, that's a key focus of our work. It's where the, probably the bulk of WFP's resources go towards helping to mitigate situations of conflict. Um, but then uh, it's not enough. We also need to focus on and we need to be involved in the recovery and reconciliation. How we work, who we work with, what we focus on can, can all either contribute or even detract from recovery and reconciliation. And that's uh, a critical part of the contribution we can and must make to peace uh, in which uh, President Johnson Sirleaf uh, managed so ably during her time as president of, Li of Liberia. Uh, our role is to support governments. We're not a lead actor. We are a supportive role. Uh, but we, we also uh, bring not just uh, our own capacities, but also helping to mobilize private sector, so focusing on economic growth, uh, other UN partners, civil society. Uh, this is all part of breaking the silos, and it's how we all contribute to that to uh, promote sustaining peace. Uh, lastly, I would just say that um, uh, peace uh, actors, uh, everyone needs to contribute in their own way. Uh, we contribute in the ways that are available to us, but we count on others bringing different capacities to contribute also to peace in their way. That's how you get to sustaining peace. That's how you get to achieving the SDGs. Thank you. Thank you so much, Stanley. That was uh, quite interesting uh, how everything is interlinked with the, everything and all the SDGs also depend on each other. And we and all different partners depend on uh, each other. Uh, we're now going to move from a more helicopter uh, view uh, to the field perspective. Mary Ellen McGrogy is the country director of Afghanistan for World Food Programme. And she will elaborate on how World Food Programme's work in Afghanistan contribute to the prospect for peace in that special context. But first, we would like to invite uh, you to Afghanistan uh, by means of this little video. In Afghanistan, one in three people now face hunger due to protracted conflict, climate-induced natural disasters and COVID-19. Against all odds, the lives of these communities in northeast Afghanistan have been changed for the better, thanks to WFP's resilience building work. The Unity Canal, built together with Shelter for Life and the local communities, is not only connecting communities between the provinces of Takhan and Badakhshan, but also providing water for more than 800 hectares of arid land. Two-hundred kilometers away in Badakhshan, another canal is being built. Once complete, it will help transform 1,000 hectares of land into agricultural fields. The income generated from the fields means villagers no longer need to leave home to look for work. By keeping families and communities together and building their resilience against shock, we contribute to social cohesion and lasting peace.
Afghanistan is breathtaking, right? Yeah, it did for me too when I walked the canal a few weeks ago. It really is a nexus of unity, prosperity and peace. Greetings from Kabul, fellow panelists, and good afternoon, everyone online. I'm delighted to be here today with our partner, Shelter for Life, to speak to the life-changing impact and new beginnings we can create when we come together as a community around zero hunger and peace. As sadly, Afghanistan is too often in the news with heartbreaking news of stories of conflict, suffering and fragility. Decades of war, exasperated by climatic shocks, and now the pandemic, has pushed one in three people, 14 million people, into acute hunger. In addition, almost half, three million of the nation's children under five will suffer from acute malnutrition at some point this year. In addition to the intense fighting and that displaces thousands and causes terrible loss, also the burden and impact of climate change translates into increased water stress, loss of arable land, ravaging hunger, and fuels localized conflict and distrust. But we can change it with localization, the people and communities in the driving seats, supported by partnerships of ambition, knowledge, complementarity, and resources, we can break down the silos to deliver transformative and life-changing programs that condemn hunger to the past and instead foster peace and prosperity. In Afghanistan, the peace nexus is about leveraging our core humanitarian activities to contribute to the broader and longer term transition to peace and development. In practice, this translates into understanding the drivers of hunger and conflict, responding with locally driven solutions, conflict sensitive solutions that lessen the impact of recurrent shocks, prevent widespread hunger and make possible local conflict resolution and in tandem working at the national level in, to support the country achieve the SDGs as part of the UN system on policy design for nutrition, social protection, disaster management and transformative food systems. Critical to the aspiration, the possibility and the set success is our grassroots engagement and the tapestry of partnerships. Hand in hand with government at the national and local level, with civil society and NGOs such as Shelter for Life, distilling knowledge and learning with research and academic institutions, and all made possible by the generosity of our incredible donors that provide flexible funding and engagement, and amongst which Sweden plays a leading role. The Canal of Unity you've just seen in the video weaves together WFP's humanitarian and development competencies, the agenda of government, blended and enabled by the technical know-how and community reach of Shelter for Life. It demonstrates the possibility of how solutions to address and prevent hunger can contribute to peace. Now to express really the spirit and the impact much more eloquently than I can, I will defer to the words of a beautiful son of this wondrous and anguished land that is Afghanistan, the poet Rumi. It is good to leave each day behind like flowing water, free of sadness, Yesterday is gone and its tale told. Today, new seeds are growing. Thank you from Afghanistan. Thank you, Mary Ellen. Uh, and I was very pleased to hear that you were um, stressing that you see there's hope. Uh, that really made me very hopeful. And um, we've heard uh, about Shelter for Life uh, a couple of times now this, um, uh, uh, th this hour. So now, Mustafa Umay from Shelter, uh, International, uh, Life, Shelter for Life International. You are one of the um, NGO partners of uh, VFP in Afghanistan. And yourself is born and raised in Kabul and has worked in post-conflict uh, res res uh, reconstruction, peace and reconciliation efforts across the world for more than 20 years. Please, Mustafa, tell us a little bit how this collaboration works from your end. Of your mic, do you have um, you unmute? You're muted. Can I? Is this good? We hear you. Yes. Hello. <laughs> My apologies. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me, um, dear distinguished guests panelists and um, Nobel Peace Center. 
Um, my colleagues have shed light on some of the very important and, and uh, worthy issues. Uh, uh, this this uh, pandemic brought home some of the challenges people in conflict deal on a daily basis. So I would like to start by stating the, the fact that human, for human societies, conflicts are inevitable, but hunger and peace building are optional. And these uh, points, my colleague Mary, the, the uh, canals of unity, for example, are examples that have we have witnessed many on many occasions. Uh, canals of unity, water access have given. Um, I, I would like to refer to some of the examples of the field. So as what I'm saying is that uh, there are examples where um, it has allowed WFP, Shelter for Life, and stakeholders as uh, such as us uh, to establish the type of collaborative. Um, uh, partnership between communities of different ethnic origin, uh, of diverse background, so they end up working together. Um, they create pockets of hope and normalcy. They create islands of stability in which we can focus and build uh, peace and reconciliation for um, in, in context where conflict either continues or have recently um, ended. These types of programs, the, the, the one uh, to one, um, many of my colleagues referred here in these conversations, allow in the short term to reduce hunger and, and uh, the threats of starvation. Uh, but it also allows people of different backgrounds uh, ethnic background, identity background, people with griev grievances to actually work on a project that will benefit each one of these communities specifically and tangibly. Um, similar examples include a construction of a farm to market or communities to market roads where people have been able to, for the first time, reach a center where a clinic um, is accessible, a hospital is accessible. So these types of humanitarian works, these kind of development work are not limited to addressing the short-term hunger, but they pave the road for a much longer term, a, a worthy goal of establishing, promoting, and stabilizing communities and promoting peace. Thank you. Do you think it's possible, uh, thank you so much, do you think it's possible for a humanitarian initiative actually to contribute uh, towards peace building while there is still conflict going on? Absolutely. Again, I want to go back to this um, general theme of what I wanted to convey, uh, the idea of uh, um, conflict being inevitable, but peace building and hunger are optional. Uh, our work, the work of my partners from WFP and the work of other stakeholders in this panel are a good testament to that. We build uh, these islands of stability, these, these uh, uh, pockets of hope and unity on which broader and greater peace building efforts can be built. So it's not limited to finishing a conflict in order to build peace but working simultaneously as people, communities, governments, other stakeholders work on pursuit of peace to build those islands of stability. Thank you. So now our panel is back and uh, very much welcome. Um, and thank you so much, uh, Umay, uh, for uh, telling us about the situation that, and how you're working together with VF VFP. Uh, per Olsen Fritt, I was uh, wondering, in 2015, Sweden, alongside 192 other member states, pledged to reach the world, a world with zero hunger by 2030, as stated in the UN Sustainability Development Goals. Who do you see as key to support to achieve, actually, this pledge? Well, thank you uh, for, the, for this question. And, and not only are, are we uh, trying to champion the SDG 2 on zero hunger, but we're also a feminist government. Um, 
so I cannot miss this opportunity, but to, to mention that we all know, of course, that women and girls are hardest hit by, by increased levels of food insecurity and, and bear the heaviest burden during famines. Their basic needs are often neglected, and at times of crisis, they often eat least and last. But furthermore, women play a key role in, in ensuring food security, but this role is very often unnoticed. But as someone recently put it, famines are man-made problems, but there are women-led solutions uh, on how to deal with them. Uh, women produce more than six, or between 60 and 80 percent of, of the food in most developing countries and are often responsible for their families' uh, food security. But their key role as food producers uh, and their critical contribution to household economy and food security is only recently becoming recognized. Women still face discrimination and, and are limited uh, in, in, in their role. So when we talk about humanitarian responses to food insecurity and, and longer term efforts to restore agriculture and livelihoods, it's crucial that we ensure that these efforts also address gender inequalities and that they increase women's empowerment, including by ensuring access to land, to credits and productivity enhancing uh, inputs. So when we talk about key actors, I want to put our focus on, on women and girls and the increasingly important role that women play uh, in, in allowing us to find durable solutions to the increasing problem of food insecurity. Thank you. I'm very happy you uh, actually were stressing that very important uh, issue, which, which is very dear to my heart as well. And I believe actually, Fernanda Lupes Larsen, that Yara is also quite uh, concerned about uh, female smallholders and uh, farmers. We could see that in the film that you had. Um, where do you, uh, based on today's discussion, where do you see a strengthened role for the private sector in terms of achieving a world with zero well, hunger? Yeah, thank you for this very, very important question. And yeah, indeed, Yara is very, very focused on, on gender equality as well. We are a company where um, the operations are uh, actually in the hands of three women. <laughs> so we, uh, it's, it's very important um, uh, for us as well. We can, um, so I think the, the private sector can contribute um, so much um, um, to achieving a world with zero hunger. Um, through technological innovation, through knowledge transfer, good governance, and I think we can really help drive uh, an agricultural transformation in, in rural parts of Africa, but also um, Asia, for example, uh, while at the same time creating jobs, for example, for, for youth making agriculture uh, an attractive field for people to go into. Uh, but I, I feel that we need to work much closer still with other sectors and, and remove some of the existing barriers that, that are still there today. Uh, trust barriers, bureaucratical barriers. I think that sometimes disincentivize um, enterprises or institutions to operate in, in, in the more complex regions of the world. Um, I also think that the private sector can um, engage much more progressively um, in, uh, with the smallholder communities uh, in rural Africa, for example. Uh, I think the agri companies, they, they can work on building interventions to linking uh, smallholder farmers to, for example, where the money is made. Because the question in, in Africa is always, um, where are you going to sell your products, right? Who is going to buy your products? And, and I think we as companies, we, we can help create those connections um, through really, really good and sustainable uh, initiatives for, for the smallholder farmers. And I think last for me, it's about a shifting the thinking as well. I think we need to shift the, the, the thinking from philanthropy to, to long lasting commitment because it takes years to get your business model right. Um, there will be red numbers, there will be failed business plans. Um, so it takes effort, it takes determination, it takes resilience to succeed. 
Um, but it is possible. Yara is doing it. We are extremely committed um, to Africa and, and to Asia. And, and uh, I believe other companies can do that as well. We need many more companies doing this too. Thank you so much. Um, it seems uh, quite interesting to look into all the prospects, but it also is quite challenging, I can understand, to operate in these uh, circumstances. But thank you so much. Uh, Stan Lake, what do you see as the next concrete uh, step for World Food Programme to further build on already existing partnerships and create new ones? We are running a little bit short of time, so if you can be quite short, thank you. Thank you, and I'll be very brief. Uh, first, uh, we need to continue to contribute to UN reform and to help spur UN reform to be more coherent. Second, we are focused increasingly on working with international financial institutions, uh, the World Bank, but also increasingly the IMF. Uh, in addition to those, the regional development banks, Africa, Asia, Inter-American Islamic Development Bank, we've significantly strengthened our engagement and relationship uh, with those institutions, including, for example, uh, we now have a, a person deployed full-time, two people deployed full-time in Manila to work with the Asian Development Bank. Uh, and lastly, just building on what uh, our colleague from Yara said, focus on working with the private sector. We see this as critical to the longer term, critical to sustain a ability and as a public sector entity we need to figure out how to work more effectively with the uh, private sector and the cooperation with the R is a good example thank you thank you then a last question to those of you that want to answer will we reach the goal the SDG goal of zero hunger by 2030 if we are able to get this cooperation right who would like to answer no one a very difficult. <laughs> Umar, would uh, you like? I can. I can add a. Sure. Uh, uh, my perspective is yes, because of the optimism we have noticed in people's ability and resilience. Not because governments, NGOs, others can be the main uh, driver of it. It is because people are resilient. It is because people. Uh, whom we serve have showed incredible ability to, to achieve these goals. So by really working together and including the people themselves, this can be achieved, you think? You all agree? Oh, yeah. that's wonderful. <laughs> Thank you so much, and thank you so much for participating here today. Uh, I, this was a really, really interesting uh, discussion with lots of interesting and important perspectives. So thank you so much. Um, let me introduce the next uh, event. We are going to continue to explore the Nobel Peace Prize 2020 to the World Food Programme. And our last um, exploring uh, event will be on September 24th. Um, and at that um, event, we will be looking into the food systems and the larger perspective again uh, with a peace conference and a festival. So please stay tuned and uh, be with us on 24th of September. And thank you so much for watching today. Thank you. It used to be at the World Food Program, we just brought food in, but now it's a whole different ball game. We do $2 billion worth of cash-based transfers to empower families to help jumpstart, stimulate the local economies, as well as now we're buying a lot of our food in the countries where we can, in the regions where there's poverty. And as we build resilience programs, it's amazing to see what happens. What the Nobel Peace Prize has done is allowed us to message to the world, to understand the power of food and using it to bring peace, stability around the world.